Today on Free Pilot Training, we're going to be looking at all the safety regulations you need to know as a private pilot. These are popular checkride questions, and they could even show up on your written exam. But these are also good to know when you're out flying around after you get your license. Thanks for joining me for another Private Pilot Ground Lesson. I'm Josh, and today we're going to get started with one of the most important safety regulations, seat belts. Let's get started by taking a look at one of the most important regulations you need to be really familiar with, FAR 91205. As I've stated in previous episodes, this is where we find the bare minimum equipment that an aircraft has to have to be operated legally. Now, you may or may not get asked a question about this regulation on your written exam, but I can almost guarantee that you'll get asked at least one question about this reg on the oral part of your check ride. If you look closely at this reg, what you'll find is that there are different levels of equipment that you need, depending on how you're going to be operating. The first and most basic level is if you're going to be operating under VFR during the day. Now I know this should go without saying, but there is not a lower level that you can operate a standard civil aircraft. So these items you see here are mandatory anytime you go fly. Then if we want to fly at night, we have some additional things that we have to have if we want to operate legally. And if we fly under instrument flight rules, there's even more things we have to have. But no matter what rules you're operating under, you still have to have these basic things from the VFR day list. And guess what? Seat belts are one of those things on this list. But let's take a closer look at this reg because it's a little more complicated than you might think. First, the aircraft itself is required to have an approved safety belt with an approved metal to metal latching device or other approved restraint system for each occupant two years of age or older. Now, I know this is pretty straightforward, but what this is talking about is the lap belt portion of the restraint system. I'll explain the shoulder harnesses more in a second. But as you can see here, the lap belt is required to be installed in each spot where you have a human being sitting in the aircraft. It doesn't matter what year the aircraft was made. You have to have one of these for every occupant over two years old. The shoulder harnesses, on the other hand, are a different story. Basically, if your airplane was made after December 12, 1986, that aircraft is required to have an approved shoulder harness or restraint system in every seat carrying a person. If the airplane was made after July 18, 1978, but before December 12, 1986, only the front seats are required to have shoulder harnesses or restraint systems. And anytime on July 18, 1978 and before, you do not have to have shoulder harnesses installed at all. But once again, you must have the lap belt installed. Now no one's going to expect you to remember all these dates, but be sure you know where all these dates are found. And once again, that's in 91205. Now that we know what's required to be installed on the aircraft, let's take a look at how we're required to use those systems. For this, we need to turn over to FAR 91107, the seat belt regulation. As you can see here, before we can take off, the pilot in command is required to make sure that everyone on board is briefed on how to fasten and unfasten their safety belt and shoulder harness, if there's one installed. Now it doesn't specify how you need to do that, but this is required anytime you go fly with other people on board. And notice that it says you need to make sure that everyone on board is briefed. It doesn't just say to ensure that the passengers are briefed. So when you go up for your check ride, be sure to include that in your briefing. For passengers who have never flown before, you may have to physically show them how to use these things. It works just like a car seat and you also can, you can pull it to tighten it if need to be, although he's right at the max on it, but uh, and then unclip it to, to undo it and it's a pretty simple process. But for your check ride, I just recommend asking something like this. Do you know how to use these seat belts and shoulder harnesses? If not, I'd be happy to show you. Seat belt briefing complete. You don't have to do the full flight attendant demo or anything like that. But the reg doesn't stop there. If you continue to read, what you'll find is that in addition to giving everyone on board a proper briefing, you're also required to notify everyone on board to fasten their seat belts and shoulder harnesses before any movement on the surface, before you take off and before you land. In addition to that, before you can do any of these things, everyone on board needs to be in an approved seat or berth and have their seat belt properly fastened. Now for my friends out there who are wondering what the heck a berth is, that's basically a little bed that they have on airplanes and ships sometimes. That'd be awesome to have something like that, wouldn't it? 
Anyway, the big takeaway here is that everyone on board the aircraft needs to be properly buckled before we can move on the surface, take off, or land. In other words, taxi, take off, and landing. Now there are a few exceptions to this rule. Children under the age of two do not have to be buckled as long as they're being held by an adult who is properly buckled. You can also put them in an approved child restraint device. And I know this sounds like a medieval torture device, but I assure you that it's not. It's a real thing that's probably much safer than letting them sit on grandma's lap. But nobody wants to hear a bunch of screaming kids, so we let them sit on an adult's lap. I'm guessing that's a real reason why we allow that, but I digress. In addition to the lap children, there's another group of people that don't have to wear their seat belts or shoulder harnesses. If you're engaging in sport parachuting, in other words, skydiving, you're most likely going to be using the floor of the aircraft as a seat. In this case, you don't have to wear a seat belt. Maybe someday I'll try that. I don't know, it seems sketchy. I know we've already talked about a lot of information, but we're not quite done with seatbelts yet. There's a few more requirements for crew members over in FAR 91105. During takeoff and landing, and while en route, each required flight crew member shall be at the crew member station unless the absence is necessary to perform duties in connection with the operation of the aircraft or in connection with physiological needs. This means that while you're out flying around, you cannot get out of your seat unless it's absolutely required for the operation of the aircraft or unless you need to go relieve yourself of that Taco Bell you had before takeoff. In addition to that, crew members must keep their safety belt fastened while at the crew member station. So technically, you need to have your lap belt fastened for the entire time you're out flying around. With that in mind, the shoulder harnesses are a little bit different. According to 91105, crew members only have to wear the shoulder harnesses during takeoff and landing. Now, I do want to point out that the reg does say that if your aircraft is not equipped with shoulder harnesses, then you don't have to wear one. But notice that there are no dates in this regulation. That's because a lot of older aircraft have had shoulder harnesses added after the reg was created. And if your aircraft has a shoulder harness installed, you have to wear it during takeoff and landing. This Cessna 172H was built in 1966, so it was built before 1978. At some point in time, one of the owners had shoulder harnesses installed. And now that they've been installed in the front seats, we are required to use those. With that in mind, 91105 does say that you don't have to wear the shoulder harnesses if it's going to make it where you're unable to perform your required duties with the shoulder harness fastened. I know that there are a lot of pilots out there who take this as a license to not wear the shoulder harness. But I want to show you something in FAR 91205. Shoulder harnesses installed in flight crew stations must permit the flight crew member when seated and with the safety belt and shoulder harness fastened to perform all functions necessary for flight operation. This means that the shoulder harness manufacturer must design the shoulder harness so that it cannot interfere with your required duties. So I'm going to tell you right now that if you get caught not wearing your shoulder harness on takeoff and landing, I can almost guarantee you that this excuse is not going to work. Okay, I think that's enough about seat belts, but before we move on, let's talk about a few more pieces of required equipment that you'll find in 91205. First, if you're operating an aircraft for hire and you're going to be flying beyond gliding distance from the shore, you need to have approved flotation gear readily available to each occupant on the aircraft. And you also need to have at least one pyrotechnic signaling device aboard the aircraft. I know a lot of you guys may not be operating for hire. But even if you're not, it would still be a good idea to follow this rule because no one ever plans on making a water landing. I can't even imagine ditching an aircraft miles from shore and trying to swim the whole way without any kind of flotation device. Wilson! 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 With that in mind, if you are going to be flying over large bodies of water, this would also be a good time to consider how far your aircraft is capable of gliding if you were to lose an engine. Typically, you'll find this information in the performance section of your POH. Okay, I've got to know who puts a giant plane silhouette right in the middle of a precision chart. I don't know why they do this, but as you can see here, Cessna 172s tend to glide at about a 1 to 10 ratio. So that means for every 1,000 feet of altitude, we'll glide about 1.5 nautical miles. So if I'm at 2,000 feet and I'm more than 3 miles away from land, I should really have life jackets on board the aircraft. Another required piece of safety equipment that you'll find in 91205 is the ELT, or Emergency Locator Transmitter. This device is required for most general aviation aircraft, and it's designed to help locate an aircraft that has crashed. 
the emergency locator transponder is activated by high g-forces to the aircraft. So if you exceed these forces by crashing or if you have a really hard landing, it can activate this thing and when this guy activates, it sends the most annoying audio tone through the emergency radio frequencies. See, I told you it was annoying. But anyway, on older aircraft that have old analog ELTs, when this thing gets activated, the signal transmits on 121.5, which is the civilian emergency frequency, and on 243.0, which is the military emergency frequency. By the way, sometimes you'll hear these frequencies referred to as guard or the guard frequencies. And in case you didn't already notice, 243.0 is exactly double of 121.5. That's a pro tip for remembering these on the written exam. If you pass the written test by one question, and this was one of them, all you have to do is buy a hat or t-shirt from me to say thank you. You'll be thanking yourself, really. But anyway, if you set this thing off, everyone monitoring guard is going to hear the signal. ATC is required to monitor these frequencies. And in addition to that, most military aircraft monitor 243.0 when they're out flying around. And if you want, you can monitor 121.5 when your buddy flies his first solo. So you can make fun of him when he has a hard landing and he sets this thing off. With that in mind, there is a newer digital ELT that slowly started to take the place of these old analog systems. If one of these guys is activated, they'll send a signal out on 406 MHz, and this will be picked up by satellite. The best part about this new system is that it can also transmit your tail number, aircraft type, location, and even the aircraft owner's name to the authorities. And that makes search and rescue a lot faster and easier. In addition to that, because these satellites are up in the sky, they're way more likely to receive a signal since you don't have to worry about line of sight with a radio tower or another aircraft in the area. Before we move on, there are a few more things you should know about ELTs in FAR 91207. But probably the most important thing that you should be aware of is that the ELT needs to be inspected every 12 calendar months. And because of that, this inspection is usually done with the annual inspection. So this is where most mechanics document that the inspection was completed. But sometimes you'll find it documented somewhere else. 91207 has a complete list of what the AMP mechanic is required to check. But a few things that he's looking for is proper insulation, operation of the crash sensor, and battery corrosion. And speaking of the battery, here's something super important you need to remember. The ELT battery needs to be either recharged or replaced anytime 50% of its useful life is expired or if the transmitter has been in use for more than one cumulative hour. That's why a lot of people check to make sure that their ELT is not going off when they secure the aircraft. You can do this by tuning your radio to 121.5 and making sure you don't hear... <coughs> Sorry, I've just had my eardrums blasted out so many times, I'm just trying to pass on a true aviation tradition. You may also consider checking 121.5 if you had a hard landing because if you activate it and you continue to fly around for an hour, then the battery will need to be recharged or replaced. If you're concerned that you might have activated one of the newer ELTs, most of the time they'll have some kind of light or alarm to let you know that they've been activated. So that makes it kind of nice, I guess. Now there may be times when you want to make sure that the ELT is working properly. Maybe you've had a really hard landing and you think it should have gone off, but it didn't. You are allowed to test the older analog systems to make sure they're working properly but there's a specific time that you have to do that. You're only allowed to test these things five minutes after every hour. If you do it any other time, ATC is probably going to send a search and rescue party after you. The newer digital systems are a little more complicated, so they really should only be tested by approved technicians. While we're on the dreary subject of crashing, I think now's a good time to talk about accident and incident reporting. Now this stuff actually has its own regulation. That information is in part 830. And there's not a ton of information in here, but what you'll find is that the NTSB needs to be notified anytime an aircraft is involved in an accident or anytime a certain incident occurs. First things first, let's talk about the difference in an accident or an incident. An accident would be anything that causes serious injury or death to a human being while on an aircraft. It could also be something that causes substantial damage to an aircraft or a combination of the two. This can be anything from an actual airplane crash to a bad landing where someone on board gets seriously injured. Now this regulation explains in detail the exact definition of serious injury and substantial damage. So if you need that information, you can really easily find it in this document. It's only seven pages long. An incident, on the other hand, is something that affects the safe operation of an aircraft 
but it doesn't really qualify as an accident. We'll look at some examples of an incident here in a second. Now, if you're unlucky enough to have an accident, you are required to notify the NTSB or National Transportation Safety Board immediately. Once you notify them, they'll typically ask for a written report that must be submitted within 10 days. But if you have an incident, you only need to notify the NTSB if it's on their list in Part 830.5. If it's on this list, you need to notify them immediately for those as well. Here are a few incidents where they want immediate notification. A flight control system malfunction or failure. Ill crew members that become unable to perform their normal flight duties. Failure of any internal turbine engine component that results in the escape of debris other than out of the exhaust path. An in-flight fire. An aircraft collision in flight. Release of all or a portion of a propeller blade from an aircraft, excluding release caused solely by ground contact. An aircraft is overdue and it is believed to be involved in an accident. Once again, the complete list is in Part 830.5, but if you have an incident and you think it might qualify, this is where you need to look. If it's on this list, you need to notify the NTSB immediately. And if they request a written report, you have 10 days to turn that in as well. But you only have to submit the report if they request it. Now, if for some reason you have an accident or an incident on this list, it's possible that the NTSB will send someone out to investigate the scene. You should do everything possible to keep it the way you found it. You should only move the wreckage if you need to do so to protect it from further damage. Now, one other thing that's going to help make it easier for the search and rescue teams, the FAA, and the NTSB is to make sure that your address is up to date in the FAA system. In fact, according to FAR 6160, you are required to change your address within 30 days when you move to a new address. If you don't, you are not allowed to exercise your pilot privileges until you do that. And you can update that on FAA.gov or if you're old school, you can still send a written request to this address right here. Okay, enough about accidents. Let's talk about oxygen requirements for a little bit. When do we need to carry or use supplemental oxygen when we're in an aircraft? Well, oxygen is required when there's a risk of hypoxia. Now, I plan to discuss this more in a separate episode, but hypoxia is basically a loss of oxygen to the body. So at higher altitudes, we're at a greater risk of getting hypoxic, and this can affect our ability to do different tasks. Because of that, the FAA has developed a regulation that's designed to keep you from choking yourself out at high altitude. I said choke yourself! Now lean forward and choke yourself. Are you through grinning? Sorry, yes, sir. Basically, at any cabin altitude at 12,500 feet MSL and below, you don't have to have anything. If you pass out from hypoxia, you probably have something else going on with your body and you probably shouldn't be flying to begin with. Now, I do want to point out that this is a cabin altitude of 12,500 feet and below. If you're flying a non-pressurized aircraft like 99.9% .9 of training aircraft, cabin altitude equals your true altitude. But if you ever start flying an aircraft with a pressurized cabin, this is going to be different. With that in mind, at cabin altitudes above 12,500 feet MSL and all the way up to 14,000 feet, if you're going to be flying up there for more than 30 minutes, the minimum flight crew needs to have and use supplemental oxygen while you're up at those altitudes. If you're flying at a cabin altitude above 14,000 feet, the minimum flight crew must use that oxygen the entire time. Now, up to this point, you might have noticed that we haven't even discussed passengers at all. Yep, that's correct. There is no requirement for you to provide oxygen to your passengers at the altitudes we just discussed. I guess no one really cares if your passengers pass out. But the second you fly above a cabin altitude of 15,000 feet MSL, at that point, you have to provide every occupant on board the aircraft with supplemental oxygen. So I guess the moral of this story is that passengers aren't really essential to a safe flight. So no, you don't have to provide them with supplemental oxygen unless you're flying at a cabin altitude above 15,000 feet. But I personally would reserve cabin altitudes above 12,500 feet for passengers I don't really like. Now, if you move on to pressurized aircraft, you'll find some additional info over in 91211. So if you need that information, go check it out after this video. Since we're on the subject of altitude, now that you know what you need to fly at high altitudes, let's take a look at some of the lowest altitudes you can fly. The details on this information are in FAR 91-119, but I'll give you the general scoop. 
First things first, no matter where you are, you cannot fly an aircraft at an altitude where you can't make a safe emergency landing if you lose an engine. Now this doesn't apply if you're taking off or landing. With that in mind, a safe emergency landing means that you cannot create an undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. Let's pause here and talk about this for a second. First of all, the reg specifically says undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. I'm not telling you to be stupid about this, but this is something to consider. With that in mind, this reg seems to be a catch-all to keep you from flying too low. But I just want to point out that if you're flying at a low altitude, but you're also flying at a high airspeed, you have the ability to trade your airspeed for altitude. If you've never done this before, I highly recommend trying it sometime with your instructor. And you don't have to practice this maneuver at a low altitude. But practicing this allows you to see how much altitude you could potentially gain if you suddenly lose an engine for some reason. This maneuver is called a zoom climb, and it could potentially buy you some time if you ever lose an engine. It could be the difference in landing somewhere that you don't want and landing in a nice soft field. Okay, in addition to the FAA's catch-all regulation, if you fly over congested areas, you may not fly less than 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within a 2,000 feet radius from the aircraft. Here's what the FAA considers a congested area. Basically, any congested area of a city, town, or settlement, or over any open air assembly of persons. If you're unsure what exactly a congested area is, the VFR sectional depicts congested areas of a city or town in yellow. And this would be a good thing to look at if you're going to be flying low. Next, we have other than congested areas. In these areas, you cannot operate less than 500 feet above the surface unless you're flying over water or sparsely populated areas. In these areas, there's no minimum altitude, but you cannot fly closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. Once again, the only exception to the last couple requirements is when you're taking off or landing. If you're taking off or landing, you are allowed to get closer than 500 feet on some of these things, but please use common sense and good safety practices when you do that. Now there's actually another regulation that goes hand in hand with those min safe altitudes that you find in 91119. Did you know that you can actually legally drop stuff out of an aircraft? Yup, I know it seems crazy, but as long as you follow the guidance in FAR 9115, it is possible to do it legally. All it says in this reg is that no pilot in command of a civil aircraft may allow any object to be dropped from that aircraft in flight that creates a hazard to persons or property. However, this section does not prohibit the dropping of any object if reasonable precautions are taken to avoid injury or damage to persons or property. So as long as you take reasonable precautions, you can drop stuff out of your aircraft. The next thing we need to talk about is drug and alcohol usage. Even if you're like me and you don't drink, you really still need to know this information because you could get asked about it on your check ride or your written exam. But in addition to that, if you have a passenger that gets involved with these things, there's some things you should know about that. For 9117 is the reg for this topic. First of all, no person may act or attempt to act as a crew member of an aircraft if they've consumed any alcohol within the last eight hours. So that's eight hours from the time you touch the bottle to the time you touch the throttle. Now with that in mind, there's a catch-all on this reg. It says here that you can't even be under the influence of alcohol. So if you're hungover, you cannot fly, even if it's been more than eight hours. Drugs are also a big no-no. You cannot use any drug that affects your faculties in any way that is contrary to safety. If Tylenol affects your faculties contrary to safety, you cannot fly after you've taken that. In addition to that, if your blood alcohol is 0.04 or greater, you are not allowed to fly an aircraft. For those of you who don't know, that's half the legal limit in most states for driving a vehicle. And there's a really good reason for that. When you fly at higher altitudes, the effects of drugs and alcohol are way worse. So it's best not to take any chances when you plan on flying. Now you may think that no one's going to be out there checking to make sure that you're sober when you're out flying. But any law enforcement officer can force you to take a breathalyzer or a blood test. And you as a pilot are required to take it. Remember, alcohol can be detected in the blood and breath more than three hours after you've consumed it. And if you get convicted, I can almost guarantee that at the bare minimum, you will probably have your flying privileges suspended. The FAA takes these things very seriously. In addition to the crew member requirements, there's something else you should know about passengers who are under the influence. Except in an emergency, no pilot of a civil aircraft may allow a person who appears to be intoxicated or who demonstrates by manner of physical indications that the individual is under the influence of drugs except as a medical patient under proper care 
to be carried in that aircraft. So if you suspect that your buddy is high because he's showing any kind of physical indications, you are required to leave his butt on the ground. If you don't and you get caught, you could potentially pay the price for his stupidity. In addition to all this, FAR 6115 has a few additional requirements if you're ever convicted of a drug or alcohol offense while driving a vehicle. If you're convicted of any drug or alcohol offense while driving a vehicle, you need to let the FAA know as soon as possible. You are required to send a written report to the FAA Civil Aviation Security Division within 60 days of a conviction. You'll find the address in this reg if you need it. Now, if you end up needing this, check out this regulation for the most complete information. But basically, if you drive while intoxicated, impaired, or under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you are required to let them know. Even if you weren't under the influence when it happened, if you're convicted of any motor vehicle offense and drugs or alcohol were involved at all, you need to let them know about that as well. So if you run a stop sign and you had drugs in the car, you need to notify them. Yes, there's a chance you could get your flying privileges suspended, but if you ever want the chance of getting those back, you need to notify them if any of these things happen to you. In addition to all that, if you decide you want to enter the drug industry and you get convicted for possessing, making, transporting, distributing, or the sale of drugs, you can basically kiss your flying privileges goodbye. This applies to narcotics, marijuana, depressants, stimulants, and other substances. If you get involved with these, or if you're convicted for operating an aircraft under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you will most likely have your certificate suspended or revoked. And I know how hard you're working on these things. Don't throw them away by being stupid. I hope you learned something from today's lesson on the private pilot safety regulations. Please smash like if you learned something from today's video. In my next video, I'm going to talk about all the stuff you need to know as far as aircraft maintenance is concerned. When that video is finished, I'll put it right here. In the meantime, if you're struggling with landings, in this video, I've got 10 tips that are going to help you improve those landings. I'll see you over there. See ya. Approach, you're not going to believe this. I just bought a free pilot training. I'm going to keep on watching.